Great. Okay, so today we're going to be discussing something that I have mentioned at a couple points um, uh, previously. Um, but it is something which I am requiring because it is a software best practice. It's something that aids a lot um, in some of the other goals we've talked about, which are testability, for example. And that has to do with this notion of software contracts or, or specifications, okay? So you recall last time we talked about a bunch of different investments we can make in testability. Uh, some of them are listed here, and I won't go through them in detail, but they include things like assertions, um, uh, having in place logging mechanisms, test hooks. Um, there's also some process-related things like writing tests first and engaging in mocking and having a, a mocking framework in place. Um, now, another key component I mentioned last time was this notion of modularity. Having the program not in, in big hairy patches of code, which, you know, to test one small piece of it, you have to test the whole thing, but rather to divide it up into small pieces. And traditionally, we put those small pieces in functions or methods. You know. um, and a key thing that goes along with that to enable testing, a key thing for allowing those things to be written independently and to evolve independently, are specifications, okay, or software contracts. And today we're going to be focusing on those those specifications, okay. Um, so the argument that I made in brief, and I'm not going to go through this technical this this conceptual stuff as much as I could, is that look, building uh, competitive, performant. Um, and uh, powerful modern software is not easy. It's hard. Software is getting ever more complex structurally and how it works over time. There's many moving parts. So lots of interconnections. We're building bigger and bigger things with these small building blocks we can use from libraries, frameworks, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and we're using <coughs> higher level languages to allow us to build up this functionality. And uh, increasingly, it spans multiple platforms, certainly front end, back end, database, et cetera, all in one app. Okay? Um, and there's a lot of surprises that can come from this. It's, it's, it's complex in the sense that the sum is greater than the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, and this complexity is a major, a major barrier to delivery of value. And, and really, if you look back over the history of software, a lot of the challenges has been coordinating a set of people and resources to take on this this complexity it's hard it's hard to build these large-scale things if you think about building a platform like Facebook or a platform like Twitter which guarantees you know almost instantaneous transmission of these messages or you think about Instagram or snapchat or you think about Google I mean these these things are, are very complex and if not managed really well in a coordinated way, way they, they tend to be laid over budget, substandard quality, in a way that they'll fail. <coughs> um, uh, and I argued just a few minutes ago, and I made reference to it last time, that a key way of managing this is, is the separation of concerns. We divide uh, a, a big task up into pieces, and we have a uh, a separation of concerns, a divide and conquer, where we take the different pieces in, uh, of that task, the, of the overall thing, and we put them into small pieces of code. And we put these pieces of code into functions or methods. You know? um, and why do we do that? Well, look, it helps in understanding the software. We can understand a piece without having to look at everything. We see calls to other things, but we don't have to look at them unless we need to know what's there. We just see calls, hopefully with good names, that make it clear what's going on, good comments. Um, we, we have different concerns in different areas. So, for example, we have UI-related visualization stuff, output stuff in the view layer, right? We have input response to user requests in the controller layer, right? And we have 
sort of domain logic and often backend interface stuff in the model layer. We separate these things out into pieces and, and that allows different people to build them. Uh, it allows us to focus on one thing at once and to solve individual pieces rather than having to deal with, with the whole thing. So it allows us to sort of divide and conquer. We can have different people work on different parts and we can evolve those parts over time. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of benefits to this creation of the code. You can write the different pieces over time separately. You can modify those pieces over time. This is often critical. So much of software is about fast evolution when needs change from the client or we perceive a different need or they, they recognize by seeing the software they actually want something different than they originally said. Um, when the technology changes and we can do some things more easily and we decide to add a feature to do that. Um, things have to evolve. Software is in large part risk management against needs for evolution. You build software in a way it will evolve easily in the way you anticipate and other things are more rigid that you don't anticipate evolving that much. Um, this division into different pieces also helps testing. It helps debugging. Um, we can reason about what's going on in each piece debugging wise. We can test each piece and we can localize problems in each piece. It helps in review and specialization. We can have different people specialize in different pieces. Now, a key to this modularity, to have this modularity be effective is these little pieces that you build up, you want them to be general. To not just handle one thing, but to handle many things. Why do we want that to be general? Why do we want these pieces out of which we build this system to be general rather than sort of hard coding certain things? Why? Anyone? So, can they, so they can be used multiple? Yeah. Multiple they can be used many places in the code. We have slightly different needs in different places. You know, we call print, printf, whatever, with different particular arguments, but we can reuse the same function, right? It's not hard-coded print integer, and we only can print integers or something. We can code that with percent, percent %d or whatever, right? Percent %g for a floating point number. We can reuse the same, as we say, abstraction, which sort of captures printing in a, in a very flexible way. And there's really two ways. It's, it's easy to miss this point, but Abstraction is this process of putting aside details and treating many particular needs as similar. So printf, we put aside you know, the details of exactly what it's printing out and what types of numbers or whatever it involves. And we have, we have one function which does all of that, right? It handles all these different variants. It, 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 abstracts away from those details and just handles this, this in general. It handles the commonality of all these cases, right? And it turns out it's really useful to handle things for a broad bunch of cases, not only because we can reuse it, but over time, if our needs change, we can reuse the same thing. We don't have to go and change it, right? If, we have to, if the user says, I want to see something different printed, I want to add a colon or something, we don't have to... We don't have to go rewrite the whole function. We just add a colon and a string and boom, we use the same abstraction, right? So this way of achieving generality, handling many particular cases is key for evolution. It's key for, for reuse. Now there's two ways of capturing this in general ways and abstracting away from details. Most is the one I've been referring to, the one that's most obvious. It's, it's what's called abstraction by parameterization. Okay. Basically, we pass in different parameters that say what we want to do. So we, we have a sort routine, and we pass in different arrays to the sort routine, right? Or we say, you know, I'll put this to, to the screen, uh, and we pass in different uh, particular icons or whatever, and, and, and sticks in that, right? We, it's parameterized because we pass it different things to do different jobs, right? Uh, and it allows for multiple different uses at different um, places. That's great. But the other thing is something I'm going to be talking about today. 
It's less obvious, but I would argue as important. And it's what's called abstraction by specialization, by specification, excuse me, specialization, specification. So here, we're not actually handling many different uses, per se. We're handling many different implementations. This is what allows us to evolve as creators of a function, how we implement that function. Why might we want to evolve how we implement a function? Why, once we write a function, might we want to change it? Better time complexity? Yeah. We, make it, wanna make, we wanna optimize it. We wanna add a cache to this thing. It's computing these values and we realize, wait a minute, 90% of what it's computing is you know, three or four different cases. Instead of computing it each time, let's, let's memoize it, let's cache it. And each time we just, if it's one of these top 10 cases, we'll just return it instead of recomputing it. Make it whip fast for those common cases, right? Or we want to have a better algorithm, right? We want to go from, a, uh, from an algorithm that's greedy, uh, excuse me, that's, that's sort of brute force to something that's greedy and pretty good. It has good approximation to the actual solution. Or it's an actual, just, uh, it's, it's the same, same, solves the same problem exactly, it just does so more efficiently, right? Want to go from bubble sort to quick sort, or to merge sort, or to radix sort, right? Um, yeah. Would it be um, allowed to try and make that function to two functions, or would that be like not part of the abstraction? We 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 could. Um, it turns out that that's going to. So when we think about a contract between one component and another, that's where we're going. Okay, and breaking up what's been one function to two functions will most commonly it'll actually change the code that's calling them. But the way in which you can do it is you can actually still retain the original function, but you actually break it up into two pieces, which could also be called separately. Yeah. The way I was thinking about it is like sometimes yeah. you have a block of code yeah. that runs as like lots of checks. Yeah. So you can take all those checks into a separate function, for example. Right. And then like have a bool that switches on or off. Yep. Rather than going through the whole Absolutely. function. Absolutely. Would that still be abstraction? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you're you're abstracting out the details of those of those checks and you're capturing it in a function which could then be reused by the code that calls it there or That's elsewhere. Exactly, yeah, so you, yeah. you can like cut corners that way. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cutting corners in a good way. Not, I mean, people talk about cutting corners as like compromising quality, yeah, yeah. but this is not cutting corners. It makes it easier. Yeah. I mean, um, the guy who invented Perl sometimes argues laziness is a virtue when it comes to software because yeah. you're always trying to save yourself work. Not, not just in the short term, but in, in, if you're willing to do it in the long term, one of the ways you do that is you reuse things. And that can be really good to think about those efficiencies. So absolutely, that would be a case of abstraction. You say, look, especially if you're doing this a couple different places, or if, if those checks, you know, they kind of hang together. They're the same. They're, they basically are the, the sanity checks or something. You put them in a function that is called by that name, and then every, every time someone goes to a function that needs to use those, it can just call that. They don't have to stare at all of these details. And it, it makes the function that calls them more clear because they, they can focus on the essential things in that function. The details of how it checks, does sanity checks are in this other function, if you want to look at it, right? So it's a great, great question, Mohan. Any other questions? So, yeah. There's obviously a use for it from a development standpoint. But is there for is abstraction by uh, specification? Specification, yes. Abstraction for a testing standpoint. Yes, huge, and we're gonna we're going there. Okay, so I'm just walking through each of these. Great question, and we're gonna hit that hard. Okay. Okay, abstraction by parameterization. I said, you know, the main benefit here is reuse, right? Yep. Yep, this printf thing, it can be called from many places with many different args. You sort, you call it with different arrays or what have you, right? Um, output icon, you call it with different places. So, so you reuse it at many places. You have a common need identified, and instead of recoding the same darn code at multiple places and having to debug it and test it and, and review it, 
you know, again and again the code, you put it all in one place. And all you do is you specify the variance. You say, hey, sort this array, or sort that array, or, you know, you, you print this or, or print that. You don't have to hard code all the, the details. And, you know, for the most part, we do this with formal parameters. We, we pass in different things as arguments to a function. But there's another place we use it too, which are what are called generics. Uh, you folks familiar with generics in Java, right? These are things that are called type parameterized, meaning it's like a list of bools or a list of doubles or a stack of ints or a stack of you know structs or or what have you. It's it's a often it's a collection and a collection of these things. Or maybe if if you take folks take in three forty. So you might have an option. Did you have option or maybe? Did you have a maybe or yeah, option? Yeah, we had a maybe. Yeah, so it oh, may be. 315 <coughs> for Haskell. Oh, is that right? Yeah. 315? Yeah. Oh, interesting. OK. Um, uh, so, so you might have a maybe int, right? You might have an int, or you might have nothing. Yeah. Or a maybe double, right? This is another example. It's not a collection, but it's, a, it's what we call a monad. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and here you can have a type parameterized as well. And these are really useful things. That's, it's a different type of parameterization, but again, it allows you to reuse the same code, right? You don't need to have a list of ints as a class and a list of doubles as a different class. They're all a list of x or a list of t, right? Some type. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so here, you know, we have methods and functions and they take arguments of various sorts to tell them what to do. So we go from, you know, count male and count female as separate functions to count population of a certain sex. And we say, count now for males, count now for females. And we, we can have one function that does the same basic job. You know, it captures the essential, uh, essential components of it. Or we have an array list of pairs, right? Um, or a Java uh, generic of, of doubles or what have you. Um, okay, but what I want to talk about today is mostly, so we use this abstraction by parameterization a lot. Should be familiar to all, everyone. You know. The other thing though that I really want to emphasize is abstraction by specification. And this is a little bit more subtle. And this is all about this notion, which I think, did you, did you take 270 from Ian, Ian Stavnes? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. So did he talk at all about, with object-oriented programming, this notion of separating the interface from the implementation? Did that yeah. come up? Yeah. So the idea is that this class has, a, has an interface, but the actual details of how it accomplishes those things is a little bit hidden. The things that use it, all they care about is what is this method does. How it actually does it, all the gory details, what algorithm it uses, what data structures internally, that's the business of the class. It hides it. It hides its details. It doesn't tell everyone about it has all these fields, you know, private fields, right? So you learned how to use private versus public and all that sort of stuff. That was about separation of interface and implementation, okay? Now, you may never have thought about it, but there's details being hidden here, and these are the details of the implementation. It hides the fact that it's using, you know, an int to record something rather than a boolean. It, it, it records it as zero and one rather than true or false. That's its business. It, it hides what what algorithm it's using to do the sort. You just say sort, hey sort, and maybe it's really clever. And if it's really small, it uses bubble sort. If it's only four or fewer elements, it uses bubble sort, and otherwise it uses quick sort or uses radix sort if they're guaranteed to be in a certain value or what have you. Okay, um, so what are the benefits of this? Well, look, if you hide details, you separate the interface and the implementation, um, it allows one thing to use another. So you have class A, class B. And class A can use all the functionality of class B. It can call its methods and so on without knowing how B is implemented, right? It doesn't have to know all the gory details of B. Just like you use, every day you do Java programming, you're gonna use Java.object. 
but, but you don't you haven't had to look at the source code all you care about is it lives up to its guarantees you know you can look up in the online information and you know if if you call uh, on java.object you call clone or, or well, that's on clonables but if you were to call you know to int or, or to string rather you'll get back a, a, a string that sort of summarizes in textual way that that um, an instance of that class right um, so here we can build one part of our program without without knowing all the details of the others and that's important because you know our, day, our days are busy enough. Um, we want to be able to focus on foo and not have to worry about how bar, baz, and zap are all implemented. Yeah. Um, we don't want to have to worry all about how java.object is implemented and while we're working late at night to deliver our 371 project. There's enough other things to worry about. Yeah, trust me. Um, another thing is modifiability. This is key. So we can evolve B, all A cares about is that its interface, its contract is guaranteed. What's promised in that online help information on to string is, is guaranteed. You don't care how it actually does it. The internals of its data structure and if the algorithms it uses, that's its business. As long as it provides, sticks to the guarantees that it provides you, okay? Um, and it turns out it allows for, uh, for reuse as well. Um, so you can have the same code, for example, reusing objects, the types and subtypes of that and so on. I won't get into that, but through polymorphism. Now, a big motivator for this is things change. We want to change the implementation. And one of the reasons we heard earlier is to optimize. There's other reasons we may want to change the optimization or change the implementation. Maybe we're trying to go to a new platform. We're trying to go to smart watches instead of just apps on <coughs> smartphones, and memory is more limited. So we need to we need the implementation to be more memory efficient. And instead of creating a big hunk and array, which you know for every index summarizes some information, we need a sparse array or something like that. It only so it has fewer, fewer things. In it. Okay. Um, so one reason we want to evolve, or one reason we we hide the details of our implementation, we separate the interface from implementation, is because we want to change as creators of this of this object whose interface we're telling others about. We want the flexibility. We want the opportunity. Um, we want the right to evolve its implementation. And the interface will tell people what they can count on. They can count on this these parts of, the, of what is guaranteed. They can count on those. Other things, by implication, we can evolve. By we, meaning the creators. So if we are Java, writing java.object, we promise certain things in the manual about to string. And those things we can't break. Why, could, why don't we want to break those things? Because they're expected by the user. They're expected by the user. And, and what happens if we suddenly say, two string needs to take an extra ar an argument to it? What will happen? Will good things happen? No. User, well, it'll probably break code, first of yeah. all, already created code. Second of all, it will cause users to get mad because what they expect doesn't work. That's right. Good, good. So it'll break code and users will get mad, partly because the code is broken, but partly because suddenly all their knowledge has been devalued. <laughs> like we've been counting on these things, right? And it would break in, in the case of two string, I mean, it would, it would be wild. It would break hundreds of millions of lines of code worldwide. Bad things would happen, you know. Um, okay, so, so, you know, a key thing here is we would like to hide the details of things that we think might change, like we need, might need to put a, uh, a, a better algorithm in for this, and, and uh, that gives us the right to evolve them. We don't promise what algorithm we use in the interface. We just say we sort these things. Maybe we use bubble sort at first, but 
that was just a quick hack. And we're going to actually go to quick sort, um, uh, you know, for, for this device uh, shortly. Um, and we have the right to do that because all we guarantee is that it's sorted. You know, how it's sorted is not fair. Okay, so, so, you know, here the sort of classic anti-pattern we want to avoid is, right, we have foo and bar, and each of them do a bubble sort right in line. This is a horrible. It's horrible because if we change it, we want to change things, we have to go change it every place in the code. By the way, watch out for this with, this may seem like, you know, a trivial example. Why would you ever do that? But there's a lot of places I see in student code where they repeat the same constant, a thousand. And it's not clear why, it's just a thousand in the code. Maybe it's the number of pixels on the screen for a smartphone that you assume. Um, but it's messy if every place you're depending on the number of <coughs> pixels, you know, width of the screen, you have to find the thousand. You see all these thousands, you don't know what it means. And what's worse is, if you've got to change it, you have to change it many places, right? What's worse than that, though, you might think, well, I can go find it. Wherever it occurs, I'll find it. What's, what's the problem with that? What's the problem with that? I'll just go find wherever it is, a thousand. I'll go change every thousand. Because if you forget one. <laughs> yeah, you can forget one. I mean, That's, just make a public variable with big letters. Exactly. Uh, capital letters. Yep. And make it a thousand and just keep using it. That's the way to do it. Yeah. You might see thousands in, sorry? If you have a magic number, you yeah. should make it like a That's constant right. value. Exactly. Like a big value exactly. And if you don't, if you go and change every time you see a thousand, maybe one of those thousands is not the number of pixels on the screen. Maybe it's the maximum number of lines in the config file. <coughs> and you suddenly are changing that. Or what's worse is maybe some places it's 999 because <laughs> it was a thousand minus one. But you didn't write it as such. You just wrote 999. And you don't find that when you search for a thousand, right? You miss that or you miss a thousand and one. So the point is it's really easy to miss things, especially when you're getting arithmetic via the thing. It's not obvious what it means to someone who's encountering the code for the first time. You have to change it many places. And in short, you're creating a lot of work for yourself. So you don't want to do that, right? You want to, you want to abstract by parameterization here. Look, we're doing these sorts. They're basically the same thing. There's an abstraction here. There's a there's a thing that can capture these differences in context really easily. Maybe this one passes a different array, an array of different length than the other, but we can just create a sort, right? And we can call off to them. Happy, happy, right? This will spare ourselves some work. When things change, we can call that. The problem is that right now, maybe this is a bubble sort and we want to evolve it to a quick sort. And the question is, is that gonna break things? And if, if you take a look at this code, here we're counting on ties being in the same order. And it turns out that bubble sort ensures that, but if we change it to quick sort, suddenly we've broken what's being counted on here, okay? The ties being in the same order. Because when they call sort, they can't tell from just looking at it, okay, doubles and returns a, a pointer to uh, an int, which is actually an array of ints, which basically returns the order of the indices with, within there of the sorted list, it turns out. But it's not obvious, does this guarantee this? They're just counting on it. And maybe, maybe right now it works. Okay, so they test this, it works. Great. Why is that not good enough? Okay, so they test this, they write a little test, and it works right now. Why is that not good enough? Well, okay, so suppose they, they test this and they get back the, the correct results and they say, well, foo works, bar works, and suppose they test sort, that yeah, it works to sort a sort of number. There's a problem here. The problem is you could test this. It works right now, this code, these things are in the same order. But if it changes to this, to a quick sort, it's gonna break this code. In other words, this counting on ties being in the same order, who's guaranteed that? No one. All I look at is I say, well, it returns a pointer to an, to an int, which is an int array here, and which gives the orders of the indices and the sorted value, um, how the indices are permuted to sort it. I'm counting on ties being the same order. 
There's nothing here that guarantees that. There's nothing in the implementation of the interface right now that guarantees it. So as stated here, the creators of sort could change this from a bubble sort to quick sort, and it would break this code. Because there's no fair warning that that may change. They're just assuming here that the sort will work in a way that preserves this invariant, that preserves this guarantee. And there's, there's no guarantee that it will. I mean, uh, there's no contract here. There's no agreement that necessarily this will be respected. So even if it tests properly right now, maybe it will break when this code evolves. So the question is, how do we make it less brittle? How do we allow it to handle, th allow this to evolve without breaking this code? And the answer is, um, you know, right now it's it's not good enough because, you know, either the person who changes this has to go all the places where it's called and check them, which is generally impossible because the places it's called may be created by somewhere else in some other organization. This is a library. I want to evolve it. I can't check every place it's used. Um, or, or you know, the users have to say, oh, it broke the code, sort the way the library implementers change sort, it break all, broke all my code, that's not good. We wanna make our code less brittle. So the question is, how do we define an interface? I mean, just seeing int star sort, the pack takes the double values in and returns and pointer to an int array. It's just, it doesn't hack it for guarantees. We can break code in needless ways. Do you see that? It breaks code. This, going from this to this, breaks the code. Who's at fault? Well, each side could argue the other's at fault. You know, the folks here could say, we didn't guarantee the ties are in the same order. You can't count on this. These folks say, well, I don't know what's guaranteed. It works. Right now it works. So why are you breaking it? Why are you breaking something that's not broken, right? Um, and these folks can say, well, we don't know you're counting on it. How do we know we're, you're counting on it? You shouldn't be counting on that. So it's brittle. It's fragile. We can break things. And the problem is, as software engineers, the problem is that when we're dealing with these big systems, think about it, a million lines of code, these days that's not considered that huge, actually, as in terms of Google project or a, a Microsoft project or an Oracle project or a Facebook project, a million lines of code. Okay, yeah, there's lots of those systems. We don't want to have to Every time we change one part of it, it breaks other things all throughout the system. And that way lies madness, to quote Shakespeare and King Lear. I mean, that way lies madness, right? I, I, I change this and it breaks all these things. You've went, you went through that out in that very lab out there, right? You change A and it breaks B. Chances are it broke D, B and C and D as well. You know, uh, and, and in a thing that's 10 million lines, it's madness. It's, it's hopeless. If everything we do is broken by something else, you know, a bus breaks down in Saskatoon, the university can't function. What sort of world are we living in, right? If, if everything is so coupled that it's fragile. We can't have that if we're to manage the complexity of modern software, if we're to deliver software in time. So the question is, how do we make it less brittle? How do we define the interface so it's less brittle? And the basic deal is, look, it's not enough to just say this. We want to say something more about what this guarantees and what it doesn't guarantee so that the people who use it can know what they can count on and by implication what they can't count on. These folks need to know I can count on the ties being in the same order or if that's not promised it's this is wild can't count on that and I better not count on that. You know I better I better use another another library or I better put my code in place so it, it can be robust even if that isn't the case. Okay, so we don't want to just count, oh, it tests right now, it works right now, because other people's software can evolve. So what we're looking for is something beyond just, you know, in star, you know, something that takes in a double value. We want a contract of sort, a contract that makes certain guarantees, just like FedEx makes certain guarantees to you. You don't have to know all the details of how FedEx manages their operation. When you go to FedEx and you want to ship your package, all you need to know is you're dropping it off by the deadline. It's going to get to your destination by 5 p.m. the next day. That's it. 
you don't have to worry about who's flying the plane and and you know who's out sick and you know who drives it to the airport and exactly what time the plane takes off and what the computer system is that's their business it's not your business you don't want to your life is complicated enough you don't want to have to worry about it same thing with software we want a contract so fedex has a contract with us they will deliver on time or we get our money back or what have you that's what we want here okay we want a contract it will guarantee certain service okay so we want something that will say okay hey this thing sorted indices um given an array of double gives returns an array consisting of permuted indices of the elements of the original array. the indices of, with the ordering of those indices being such that the elements of those indices are arranged in ascending order okay smallest to largest it's precondition mark that is that the the array passed in is is not null and the return value specifies uh, for each sorted in the, the index where that element uh, originates. Notice it says ties, values with equal value, retain their original order. Yeah. Do you always have to have like a paragraph? Because no. I've always just no. done pre -post That's it. very good. That, let's put it that way. Let's put it this way. That's a very good step already. You don't have to have a paragraph. Sometimes it's helpful to have a paragraph, and I'll show you examples where that's really useful. Um, but for this class, precondition, postcondition is going to give you most of it, as long as the name makes it quite clear what it yeah. does, yeah. right? And you need to have that with good names. Yeah. Because if the name is obscure, it's, it's not going to be very clear what it guarantees, uh, you know, in terms of overall functionality like what um what its job is uh to do and you can try to express that through post conditions um but it's going to be quicker for someone to look at it and just read a, a you know a sentence or two i should do like pre post just to make sure that it's okay in the class yep so i do pre post and then if it's like a complicated yep. algorithm i have like a sentence that says Great. like it takes this does this fine. does that good that's fine yeah okay. yep. yeah so contracts Contracts basically here are described by specifications, okay? Um, and there's many different ways of, of writing contracts. <coughs> but basically you want it detailed enough that it's clear, the user calls it, they can count on certain functionality. And, and that if, if it doesn't meet their needs, it'll be pretty clear. Or if it doesn't guarantee their needs, it'll be pretty clear. But you want general enough so that you can evolve it. As the creator of that method, you want to be able to evolve it. You don't want to be stuck in the same low efficiency way of doing it, right? You want to be able to use different sort methods, uh, you know, different algorithms for sorting or what have you, right? Um, and it should be clear enough to understand for those from different backgrounds and discover misspecifications, okay? So what are the benefits of this? What are the benefits for doing this? Um, uh, paragraph or not, even if it's just preconditions, postconditions. What what are the benefits of this? What are the benefits to the user of this abstraction? Yeah. You can zero like they zero in on what they need to give and what they take. Good. Yeah. So it says what it needs to do its job, and what's guaranteed when it returns. Maybe it's its return value, maybe it's something it does, right? It updates the screen or it sends an email message or it posts something to the HTTP, you know, to an HTTP uh, REST service or what have you. Um, but the point is, it's clear what job it does and what it needs to do its job well. Can I pass it a null, for example, right? Um, uh, important, practical. So it's clear there. Okay, what other benefits are there? For testing, it yeah. can help in the case of mm. uh, knowing what to test. So if you test a condition that shouldn't work out and it works out, mm. that's an issue, right? Yes. If you test a post condition that shouldn't happen and it happens, mm. that's an issue. Mm. So that's for the creator of the thing that's being called. Right. So that's good. How about for the people who are calling it? We'll get to that. I appreciate your statements on that, but how about for the people who are calling it? What are the benefits? They're calling it and they're not getting what's supposed to be, like what they're supposed Good. to get. It'll break their functions. Yeah. So like, uh, they can test it by, like, so if it expects mm -hmm. right here to return a specific, mm -hmm. you sort of element of index and it doesn't do that, yeah. 
then it's just like everything's going haywire now. Okay, so they know it's not their code. Yeah. It's it's something else going on. Yeah. So that's that's valuable. Another thing is that maybe it's just implicit for you folks is is that we don't have this madness right where we we change this and everything breaks in these other functions. We go from this to this, and suddenly all this code that calls it is broken. That's huge, because I know through the guarantees that, that this provides certain assurances no matter how it evolves. For example, here, uh, ties, values with equal value, retain their original order. I know what, however they evolve this sort, sorted indices function. How, whatever optimizations they make to it, these things are guaranteed. So I can count on it despite the evolution of this library. That's really important. You don't want to be in a situation where you know every new version of Windows that comes out or every new version of the Java library breaks your code. You want to know, okay, I'm counting on these things and, and they're guaranteed, but they can evolve in any way consistent with that. Does that make sense? It's a contract. I, I have this guarantee for my contract. For the creators of the abstraction, you can test big time. You, you, could, you know what to test, right? If we give these legal things as preconditions, this should be given back to us or done as a post condition. Yeah. That's, so it's, can you just uh, black box test mm -hmm. from just pre and post conditions? Yes. 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 Now, this question is that all we want to do well it's probably not all um at the least you want to have probably some peer review of, of it if it's reasonably complex code and so on because maybe you're writing a bunch of tests for pre and post condition but you can't test all possible inputs and so on um but that's really valuable in fact because you could black box it you don't need to look at the implementation so other people can write the test. Or you can write the test without any implementation. Yeah, like before the implementation. Yeah, test driven development. Um, so this is this is very, very valuable. Um, so before the implementation goes on, before when you say we implement the interface, meaning we, we we actually create an implementation of it, we can actually write code against it. We can test it, right? Um, we can also write code that uses it. From elsewhere in the program, you know, de development for A and B can be going on in parallel, even though A and e uses B. For that matter, B uses A. As long as what they guarantee is kept the same, you know, kept invariant, that works, right? Um, we also, for the people who create B, people who create this, the sort of indices, they can evolve this thing. As long as they contain their values, they don't have to worry they're going to break code. As, as long as they provide these guarantees, they should be able to evolve it. They, they should be able to evolve it in ways that change other things, other details, but basically it provides the people who use this a way to know what's a, de what's a detail they can't count on and what is counted, they can count on, right? Um, and uh, the creators of the abstraction, therefore, have this extra flexibility to evolve it, okay? There's some other benefits. Um, there's conceptual clarity. It's, it's clear what it guarantees. Um, you have easier understanding of the code. You don't have to read. You can read the interface, the preconditions, postconditions. You don't have to read in any explanatory sentence or couple sentences. You don't have to go read the code, right? I mean, even with something like this, it's really it's one long sentence here, yeah. right? Um, you don't have to read the code, and it's kind of stacked here, but it's, it, the point is you don't have to read the code. That's a lot easier than reading code. Um, uh, it's clear documentation of, the, of, of, of what's, uh, what's being counted on, and in some cases you can actually really optimize things by, by machine reasoning about these. I don't know, in, in, um, did you take 340 from Professor Duchin? No, uh, Professor Jamali. Okay, he didn't talk about automated um, automated proving systems. Then no, but in four seventy one, we did a mm. whatever four seventy one. We did J edit. Oh really? Four seventy. Four seventy. Yeah, yeah. J edit. Okay. And 
the program had like no pre and post. Oh. Do you remember that? Oh, <laughs> oh and yeah, it's a legacy system. That? It was and, such and a And we mess. were supposed to go in and like add three functionalities. Uh -huh. So uh, our group, I was with Austin, uh, we spent maybe like, I'm not even joking, maybe like 20 hours just reading code that we don't <laughs> understand. Oh god. Yeah, you so so you, you know like what it does, yeah, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, like you can't read it. Like, there's no like, okay, this is what the function does, and like it would be some of their functions would be like, click, click two, click three. Oh, click oh. Four. <laughs> there, there was like this massive. Did you do system? System? I did. There was it this was so massive funny. logging system that logged all this stuff. All you had to do was get it to like do an extra log, but like reading and all the other logging yeah. stuff was so such like. A that's how I learned to always use pre and post. Yeah, like I learned it the hard way. <laughs> yeah, like, that well, that's a. Sounds like, I was going to say a great experience, but um, Not really, it, it but wasn't <laughs> fun, but it was instructive, right? It was fun, yeah, in the sense of like, after we were done, I remember we actually celebrated and went for like a couple of beers, do you remember that? It taught me the horrors of looking at it. Yeah. On, on, uh, yeah, no, that sounds, particularly when the naming is horrible, right? Yeah, a, X. Yeah, and even when, Click do you remember, um, even when you compile it, it yeah. started off broken. Yeah, yeah, my compiler was, was like was a thousand a errors. Really? <laughs> yeah, like about a thousand errors. It still <laughs> ran somehow. It was so bad. <laughs> it was such a mess. There was like an animation we had to do, and it was literally all in the code, but you wouldn't know that because you had to look through all yeah. these pieces of code and like yeah. grab everything, and eventually you finally found it in like this thing that just didn't have a good name. Yeah. And that was the whole point of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah like a bad, a bad piece of, pro like a bad yeah. project, and look at the struggles. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, that's the point of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, grim, but um, but it teaches lessons. So I actually appreciate knowing about that. That's uh, quite interesting. I'll have to look at that code base. Um, don't give me code like that. Okay. <laughs> don't give me code like that. Um, so uh, yeah, despite these costs, you know, these things take a bit of time to do, but they save a lot of time in debugging. They save a lot of time in testing. They save a lot of time in parallel development. They save a lot of time basically by allowing you to avoid errors that would otherwise catch you. And and they're worth it. I know, you know, a lot of developers think, okay, I gotta pump out code, but the point is you're not gonna actually have as much time to, to code. You're gonna be spending a lot of your time debugging unless it it has these preconditions, post conditions to support it. Um another thing you can do is you can do, you know, peer review of this earlier, right? Because you could do peer review before the code's written for, for some things about, you know, A calling B even if B isn't written, right? Um, uh, you can drive many assertion checks, right? What, what do specifications have to do with assertions? Anyone? Um, you can assert things that shouldn't be in the pre or post conditions. Okay, so, so uh, you can assert that the what are true. Preconditions are true when you enter it. And when you're about to leave, what should be true? The post condition. The post condition should be true. Now, there's an interesting question. What if the preconditions are not true? What to do? And, and there's actually some different schools of thought in, in computing about this in software development. Some people say just assert and bomb out. Some people say, well, try to handle it. Try to achieve gracefully what you can. Um, there's there's arguments both ways. There are certainly sometimes you can't handle it. Or did you just throw an error. And yeah. Bomb out. It's, yeah, you bomb out, and the question is, does it is there something to handle that error up there? Or, certainly, you want to send back a report that basically says, hey, this is pro this is almost certain. I mean, it should always be a programmer error if you're doing assertions and if if there's a missed precondition it's a sign someone is asleep at the switch someone called this thing with things that shouldn't have been the case it should not result from user entering the wrong you know the wrong value on a UI or something like that it should come from programmer error um, it's easier to create tests before the code is created that's key and and we might or might not talk about it in this class but the, there's a thing called the substitution principle that guides you as to what's um, safe or be so-called be legitimate behavioral subclassing, subtyping, excuse me, including subclassing, that we'll, uh, we'll talk about. Okay. Um, and, and this affects, you know, speed of development, debugging, testing, um, 
the fact is if you spend more time debugging and you spend more time trying to get the implementation right and testing and just iterating, you're not going to get the time to put into optimization as much. Um, so what I'd like to see is, is see in your contracts a statement of high-level purpose of the cluster method. Um, Preconditions and postconditions, I'll, given the size of your group, one developer, I'll be fine with that. As long as, if it's complex, you should have a little bit more. Yeah. Um, now, sometimes in this class, we may come back to it, there's additional things for classes that you provide. These preconditions or postconditions are for methods or functions. It turns out when you come to classes, there's additional things. There's things called invariants which are sort of properties of the class that are true at any time, this is true. We talked about them before, right? Like this hash table used in the class never has duplicate keys. Um, this array should never have negative values in it. Um, you know, there's two instance variables, i and j, and j should always be at least as big as i. Um, the uh, queue that's maintained internally should never be empty. These, these are common types of things. At any one point, you can demonstrate it. There's an additional thing called a history property, which is basically comparing things as a guarantee between two points in time. So if time two is, is T2 is greater than, comes later than T1, then you can provide certain guarantees. Like this counter never declines. It only can go be the same or go up. Or the array never grows down in size, decreases in size, it can only have more items. Or the hash table can only grow. You can either stay the same or grow. And sometimes, very commonly, you'll sum, you'll, for certain systems, you'll summarize history properties. It tells how the system can change over time. It's not just something that's true at one point in time. To judge it, you have to take two to points in time and ask one is later than the other, how did it change between them? So. Um, uh, this is, um, is an important thing. And one of the history properties is it's immutable. What does it mean by immutable? Can't change. It's re or you could say it's read only. Turns out immutable values are really useful. Things that don't change. Why? Why are they useful? Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. For, 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 and, and more generally for reasoning. They actually make it really easy to reason. But there's another, another reason, um, too. Well, well, okay, I, I don't want to minimize this, though. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you in a second. But it's, it, this minimization of worry or, or reasoning is actually a big thing. Have you, have you ever used java.lang.date, I think it is? Or maybe it's... What? So, so... Are you aware of the fact that that's mutable? It can be changed. Oh, no. Now, that can cause weird things. So you think you have this date, and then some other piece of your program changes it. And suddenly what you thought was a fixed date is actually changed. has changed. So you thought it referred to <coughs> Thanksgiving. And it's actually referring now to Christmas or something like that. That's pretty weird. Um, and it's another piece of the code. You, you don't, you don't know. But what's what's a bigger issue is if something is not, if it's mutable, if it can change, it's hard to build things up out of it. If you want to build a class and you want to have pieces in the class that are guaranteed to be under the control of the class, if you have things that are mutable, it makes it really complex. Because why? Because they can change and there's more variables. Yeah, they can change. And so you've got to be really careful about returning them as values, a reference to them as values. Because if you return a reference to it, what could happen? If you, let's suppose you have a date inside. Someone can change it. Someone can change it externally. And are you going to know? Is it going to tell you nicely? No. It's going to change it inside of you. You don't know. I, my, my Thanksgiving is now last year's Christmas or something like that. That... That's a bummer, you know, it's, it's changed your internal data structure. That's not good. It's not good. And similarly, not only do you not want to return them, you don't want to take them passed in 
as arguments, references, and just stick them in as what you're referring to internally, because why not? Because if that variable is being used one place, it could be used yeah. one place. Someone else could change it externally. So you got to make a copy of it. So it turns out when you're building things out of things that are mutable, you got to copy them a lot. You got to copy them before returning them. You got to copy them when you get them passed into you. You can't just take them at face value and point to them. You got to make a copy just in case someone changes the original. You, you won't point to them. And what that leads to is an explosion of memory use sometimes where you have all this copying going on. It's defensive. It's just to protect yourself. So building things out of immutable things is actually really, really nice. And it's one of the reasons that date was deprecated. It, we're encouraged not to use date anymore. Or, yeah, it's date. Um, okay, so you know, here's some. I, I've provided here some some examples of, of preconditions, postconditions. This is Java. This is a constructor, right? Um, you could say, okay, look, the elements you pass in can't be null. Yeah. Um, for an immutable, sorry, for an invariant, is the way you just denote it is by capital letters, or is there like a certain way, like a pre and post? Oh, uh, like an invariant here. Yeah. Like so at the beginning of a class. For for an inv for a uh, invariant of a class, what you'd do is you'd probably put it up here above the declaration. Of, so this is an interface declaring the properties yeah. of the methods, but you'd put it up above here. You'd say invariant in all caps, colon. Um, sometimes it's called the rep invariant, the, the representation invariant. And you say, you know, um, this class, um, you know, for this class, this, uh, again, Q is always non-empty. This, uh, you know, this hash table never has repeat entries. Um, the, the, the values of the hash linked, uh, the values looked up in the hash table ne are unique. They never refer to the same value, all that sort of That's good stuff. It's all in the interface. It'll be all in the interface, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And basically what that allows someone so, so this is useful for reason about it. It's particularly useful for actually people who create the, the code, the implementation of this. But it can also be useful for other things. I mean, knowing if it's read only <laughs> is pretty useful if, if, or if it can change, right? Um, uh, that's for, a, um, that's for a, a history property. For an invariant, knowing, you know, for example, if um, it's always going to return value zero or more is useful. Um, so, so generally you'll provide those things. Those things aren't about, the reason they're provided for the classes, they're not about particular methods. They're things, no matter what methods you call, um, this is guaranteed, you know, like it is read only. No matter what methods you call, it's, it's read only. No matter what methods you call, this can't decrease. So, um, you know, here, for example, we can ask, uh, <coughs> you know, the elements in this and has here. And this is actually, what, what property does this have that I haven't uh, declared here? What history property? So, I, yeah, it's read only, it's, it's, it's immutable. Um, uh, all I can do is pass in elements, I can iterate through them, I can get an iterator to them, and I can ask, does it have this, right? Um, uh, note that elements can have repeats. Right? Um, so this says read only inset, but this doesn't force it to be unique. It, it might have it multiple times. Um, that's not guaranteed. Someone by th thinking they have a set might think the elements are, normally if, if they didn't see a documentation of this, they might think the elements have to be unique, that you only get three ones. So you'd say that? You'd say no, that. no, I'm saying because it doesn't guarantee that okay. here, you can't count on that. You, you, you can't count it because it hasn't guaranteed it. Sometimes when we provide something, we say, please do not count on this to make it very clear. And probably for this thing, I would say that, but it's not optional because it provides no guarantee of that and people shouldn't read it into it. It's just sometimes like the word set, it, someone could think, well, it should only return the value once if I iterate through its elements. So maybe I'd put that in there. Here's an integer set, okay. Is this read only? Is this immutable? No, no. How do we know? It yeah, it has insert and, and remove here, right? Um, uh, it has 
has, and you could test if it's in there. And you'll notice, this is important, you'll notice that you can write these preconditions and postconditions in terms of others. So, so for example, insert, the precondition is not has this, and the postcondition is has that. This is useful to kind of build up these elements of the interface using other elements of the interface. You don't have to write everything from scratch. Yeah. So this implementation yeah. for insert, it yeah. not has x, is yes. also implying that there's no duplicates. That's correct. So would you say that? Yeah, I'm you could. Saying. It's actually, this is a very good question. Let me put it this way. If, if you had this code, you were the implementer of this code, would you feel good, um, uh, would you feel good writing code in here that uh, assumes the fact that it's, um, uh, that it, it uh, well, okay, sorry. Um, let, me, let, me, let me phrase it the other, this other way. If you were a user of this class, could you be reasonably surprised if you were using one of these integer sets and you inserted something or, or you were given one of these and you discovered there were two two items of the same type in it? Yeah, I would. I, yes, you could be rudely surprised, right? In other words, you should be able to count on the fact if it says this precondition, um, there's, you would look at this and you say, there's no way. How could we ever have something that, that has a duplicate in here, right? Has is not going to create a duplicate. Remove is not going to create a duplicate. Is subset is not going to create a duplicate. Okay, union. Okay, union is only going to, okay, this is, this is an interesting one. It unions it with an integer, right? Not with an integer set. Um, and here it says, okay, returns the set consisting of the elements of, of the current set. And oh, this says set, set B. B. Okay, it's, it should be an integer set. set. Yeah, I think you. Uh, yeah, 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 okay. Okay, real time edits here. Um, there we go. Hey, come on. Um, okay, so the question is how could you have a duplicate? Well, here with insert, you cannot get a duplicate because the only way you can insert this. With union, you can. But you union, you could. So would you put that? My, my question initially yeah. was going to be: yeah. Would you put that in front of insert for your pre and post? Would you say on insert yes. on post that you cannot have a duplicate inserting? Well, well, it's implied if if this is the precondition, you should not be able to call this. But I would probably put an additional comment here yeah, saying, please note that this. Um, that that this cannot be used to insert duplicates, yeah. and a lot of like it's implied, but it saves me a lot of reasoning. Yeah. And and you know the fact is we maybe could even if we had insert doesn't allow inserting duplicates through union, we should really have something here that says please oh. note if there's an overlap, only one instance of the overlap of the intersection is is inserted, right? Yeah. So we would say you know. Um, uh, please note that if the current set and set B um, <coughs> include um, uh, have a have a non-empty uh, intersection, um, uh, only one item, um, only one instance of each uh, item in that intersection. Um, is inserted uh, uh, is inserted or something yeah um, so good call and then yes you'd probably say you know um, uh, it's just because when you start using uh, other functions in your pre and your post yes there's a lot of like coupling that starts to happen. that's right and and reasoning gets a bit harder right it's harder on the user on the user yeah that's exactly right uh, please note um, that insert cannot be used. Uh, to insert duplicate duplicate elements or something like that, um, um, or I could even say throws an error. Okay, here's a counter. So here we initialize it to zero, and we can either get or we can increment. What is this? Is this immutable? 
No. It's increment. Does this have an invariant, something that's true at all times? What, what is true at all times of an instance of this class? It'll never be negative. It'll never be negative. It'll be zero or more, right? And that's not something that's about one of these methods in isolation, right? It's not about increment in isolation. It, you have to consider also what its initial value is, right? But if you get an instance of counter, it should never be negative. Um, what's, a, what's a thing that's a history property of this? It'll never be less than it was at any point. Yeah, so if we consider two points in time, one later than the other, the value at the later time can never be less than it was at the earlier time. It could be the same, right? Just because there's no call. So, so those are examples of invariance in history properties. Um, okay, uh, uh, my read-only dictionary. What do you think? Is this immutable? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. So represents a map M from keys to elements. It's a dictionary, right? It goes from keys to elements. Okay. Um, okay, here we go. So the precondition, this is the, the constructor, pass in the keys and the elements. What is this one saying? What's this part of the precondition saying? All the keys are equal. So like if you have five objects, you have five keys. Yeah, five keys, five elements, right? Yeah. Um, and what is this saying? keys in the string of keys and the keys of, of elements is the same? Well, if you have two of the same key, it's the same thing. Y y yeah, the, it's, in other words, there's no duplicates among the keys. Yeah. So the only way you can have two keys equal to the same one. Yeah, that's, a <laughs> that's, that's a little bit weird to say, but, um, but that's, that's what it is. So the keys have no duplicates. In other words, um, uh, there's no case in which two keys are the same. Uh, with different uh, with different indices, right? Um, what is this saying? It's saying for all elements within keys, they are not null and they can't be less than, yeah. or they can't be equal to or less than <coughs> one. That's right. Let me let me um, let me put that together a bit too quickly. Um, there you go. So so for all for all keys, they're not null, and their length. They are strings after all. Right. It's greater than zero, right? And then post condition here, okay, we we set up a map from keys keys to elements, and I just say, okay, this is a, a map going from here to here. Now, that's not perfect, but it communicates, okay, if this map going from, from one to the other, right? Okay, get element. What is this saying? If I if I call get element on a key, a key can't be null. And yeah, it has to be greater than yeah, yeah, exactly. And then what does it return? It returns a value. By the way, it says this says it has to have a mapping, right? Mm -hmm. It has to be in there for me to get element. I could if, uh, otherwise I could call is occupied key, and and this will return whether it's occupied. But get element. It assumes it's in there, and it will return a value such that the key points to the value. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, there, now there's multiple ways to specify. And this is actually from Java's uh, library, I believe, um, here. Um, the, the Java standard library. So notice that this actually provides examples. Um, it provides examples of how this can be used that might catch other things, but you notice this actually provides not preconditions, postconditions. It actually provides what it says is effects. Okay, um, like what does it do? What's what's the outcome of this? Okay, um, and it says, look, if either one is null, it throws this. If this is the empty string, it throws empty exception. If S one is a substring of S two, returns the least index of which S one occurs. Otherwise, minus one. And it shows some examples. Why do we show examples? If we show examples, the user gets a taste of what to expect. Yeah, it shows kind of how it's used. And and a lot of people prefer looking at these to quickly check their understanding than to read a lot of text. At the least, these complement that text. Right. You know, you, you kind of glance at this and you say, oh, this can return one. Oh, it returns minus. Oh. Okay, you know, it returns 
the minus one if it doesn't appear inside there. It can kind of stimulate ideas. Um, uh, now you gotta watch out for ambiguity. So like if I say subset, inset, is inset a subset of this inset? It's a, here it says if S1 or S2 is null, throws this, otherwise returns true if this is a subset. What's the problem with this? Returns true if S1 is a subset of S2. Yeah, and what's the ambiguity here particularly? So yes, you are, and that's the problem. You're using, you're just saying subset. Well, that's all nice and good. I could have guessed that it's something to do with the subset, but, and it's kind of nice. It tells me about, it can throw a null pointer exception, but what's, what's, what's the problem with subset? Remember in 260, we made a distinction between what? A subset and a proper subset? Do you remember that? Yeah. Subset S1 and S2, it could be true that it's a subset even if they're what? The same set. The same set. Whereas S1 and S2, S1 is a proper subset of S2 if it's... If there's elements in S1 that are, that are not in S2. Yeah, that's, that's well, in, in S2 that are not in S1. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if S1 is, is inside S2 but it's not equal to S2, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, this is... This is kind of a uh, very, very, very detailed way. It's returns true if every element of S1 is an element of S2, else returns false. Yeah, fair enough. Um, that's, but that kind of gets you to think. Um, and you, know, you, might, uh, you might say, okay, um, uh, give a brief name, a brief description, and then have a more, a more extensive one. For someone who wants to worry about it you know this similarly has it has more if you want it or it is more text if you want it right um uh and and sometimes you know by spelling it out a little bit more it reveals an inconsistency like this says you know too cold returns true if temp is less than or equal to zero degrees fahrenheit otherwise returns false but here by specifying a little bit more like if it's not greater than the freezing point of water what's uh, what's the inconsistency here? It still says less than or equal to zero degrees Fahrenheit, but it's talking about the freezing point of water. What's the problem? Freezing point of water is not a zero Fahrenheit. It's at 32. 32. 32. So this would actually show the inconsistency in ways you wouldn't understand. Now, why is this ambiguous? Why is this top one ambiguous? Turns the integer 1 billion. Well, well, yeah, and billion means, it's actually in, in England, it means 10 to the 12th. Whereas in North America, it's 10 to the 9th. So, so I mean, billion is actually used differently. And so, you know, a little bit more explanation is, is not bad. Um, anyway, uh, I think we'll stop here. Um, there's, there's one or two more. I would strongly suggest you use this declarative type and I've provided, um, provided another one here for you to look at, okay? So I would like to see some specifications. That will help the testers. It can help peer review, and it can help debugging, et cetera. So um, use them early, use them often, okay? Thanks very much, folks. And let me know if there's any more needs for add-ons yeah, or, yeah. or plugins. I, um, yeah, I actually, Are you gonna talk to the I actually started uh, Submitted an authorization okay. for Travis. Okay, and great. I'm, I'm not sure if um, it went through. For me? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll check here.